Before you turn over, I draw your attention in Exodus 15 to verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. Now let's turn over to Psalm 118 today. Psalm 118. Today we're going to look at the first half of this psalm, and the next week we'll conclude the Egyptian Halal Psalms 113 through 118. How many times do you think this last week you cried out to the Lord for help? Do you think it was once or twice this last week? Or do you think it was several times a day this last week? How many times do you think you cried out to the Lord in your lifetime? Do you think it's in the hundreds? You're looking at thousands? How many more times do you think you'll cry out to Him before you pass from this world to the next? What we're talking about is a very particular portion of life, part of the life cycle or the pattern of life that is seen over and over again in history, but also in Scripture. Uh, we're going along and life is pretty good, and then suddenly a problem arises. And what do we do? We cry out to the Lord. And then what does the Lord do? He delivers us. And then what happens? We praise the Lord, right? And then before you know it, what happens? There's another problem. We cry out to the Lord. He delivers us. And then we praise Him once again. And by the way, it's not just us as individuals. It's also us even as a nation. How many times has our nation gone through this pattern? Things are going great. Then there's a problem, some crisis, right? Then everybody cries out to God. And He delivers, and we're back to good times, and people praise Him. But that often is short-lived, isn't it? How long does that last for us as a nation? One of the things we should be reminded of, though, in Scripture is that we should praise the Lord at all times, not just when He solves one of our problems. And Psalm 118 is a reminder of that. It's a call to the people of God to thank the Lord, to thank the Lord at all times for His mercy, for His mercy endures forever. And we'll see primarily it's focused on God's great salvation. Now, the context of Psalm 118 is one of distress. The main point, though, and this is important, at the heart of the psalm is this. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. So it's clearly focused on God's salvation. And like other psalms, this particular psalm is moving to that main point. So we begin with a call to all people to give thanks to the Lord through troubles, and then during that time, we'll experience that our faith will be strengthened, our trust will be renewed, and then the Lord will deliver us, and then we will sound the praise to the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. And then next week, we'll see how we work away from this, again, to now a very personal call, save now, for you are my God. Save now, for you are my God. And as the psalm began, so it will end. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good for His mercy endures forever. Sound like you're ready to say it with me. I'm going to say the first part. You say the second part, okay? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good for... Then you guys are ready for today's sermon. Would you please stand with me as I read from Psalm 118? And as I read that first verse, you can do the refrain with me once again. And I want to read through verse 14, the first half, but I also want to read verses 22 and 29 today for our benefit. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and all God's people said. For... Oh, now you've got to say it a couple more times. Let Israel now say. Let the house of Aaron now say. Since that's none of us, here we are. Let those who fear the Lord now say. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see the desire, my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. And the term there is to cut. I will sever them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. 
and he has become my salvation. Also verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And finally, 28 and 29, you are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and together for his mercy endures forever. I'd like to ask a, a good friend of mine, Brother Terry Crown, over to pray at this time, if you would, please. Father, we thank you for these moments together. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the opportunity of allowing us to praise your name, worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for a faithful pastor and his dear wife and family. We thank you for this church. We pray now we might be obedient, receptive to fear you, and be willing to obey as the Holy Spirit anoints your special messenger to speak to our hearts. May we believe with faith that you can do miracles today as that you have done in multitudes of years in the past. Move mightily upon us that we might know and do your will, bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So as you notice, the first four verses are a call to give thanks to the Lord, and the question would be raised is why? For his mercy endures forever. We could camp out on that again today. The word mercy, I mentioned it last week. It's the word hesed, and if you want to memorize an Old Testament word, that's a good one to remember. It is packed with meaning because it, first of all, focuses on the Lord himself. That the Lord himself has this hesed as an attribute in which God loves himself. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit's involved. The love of God flows freely from all eternity among the members of the Godhead. But what flows freely among the Godhead overflows to us. So on occasions when it's talking about God, it speaks about the love of God. But when it speaks about us, this is given to us. It's translated oftentimes as mercy or kindness or goodness. In the New Testament, we would see the counter of it of grace. And this is so important. This love of God that just overflows to us allows us to be included in the love of God so that we might be the children of God. And this is how God, in fact, works in saving us. It's essential in our salvation. But for today, let's go back to more of the heart of the psalm. This psalm was probably a responsive psalm, which means that most likely people like you did today, the leader would say a verse, a portion, or sing a verse of this psalm, and then the people would respond, for his mercy endures forever. And since we've already had a taste of that, I want us to practice a little bit more. So I'm going to read a couple of verses at which time you will say, for his mercy endures forever. You all ready to do that? Verse 4. Let those who fear the Lord now say, verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Together? Oh, that's a little bit lack of passion right there. All right, let's do that one again. Ready? The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. That's better. 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Together? One last one. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Together, for his mercy endures forever. The reason I want us to do that is just not only get a feel for it, I want to encourage every one of us to be a people ready to give praise to God at any given moment. If someone gives you an opportunity to testify, to praise the Lord, have something ready to go. Even if it's something as simple as, His mercy endures forever. Or if it's as personal as, the Lord is my salvation. Always be ready to give testimony and to praise the Lord for what He's done in your life. His mercy indeed does endure forever. Amen? Let's continue on, though, in the context here. We want to notice it's a time of distress for the psalmist, so we're now in verse 5. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. So in context, what exactly is the problem? What is this psalmist experience? What is the nature of the distress? In context, it's people. 
And it seems to be actually one particular person, as we'll see in the passage. The psalmist is dealing with haters. Now, this doesn't negate our need to call out to God <clears throat> during any time of trouble, whether it be finances or health, decisions that we're trying to make or temptation. But it does put the spotlight on the painful problem of people. And for that, you can give me a soft amen if you know what I'm talking about. People have set their hearts to hate, to be opposed to you, to be against you for whatever reasons. When I, when I look at this passage today, I, I bounce back over 30 years ago. <clears throat> to a time in my life when I was working at a place under the golden arches known as McDonald's. Um, back in those days, McDonald's had pretty high standards for quality, service, and cleanliness. There you go, QSC, right? I know that. I remember that still. You had to make sure you actually changed the temperature on the fry vat from the time you did the hash browns to the French fries so they would be cooked correctly. And for some strange reason, I still remember those temperature settings to this day. There was a rigorous training, not only for the managers, but also for the employees. But also to maintain standards, periodically, the corporate office would send people to the local stores to check them out. These were quality reviews, and they would be oftentimes unknown, but on occasion, they would come in and spend an entire week there scrutinizing everything, pulling every fryer, looking underneath every chair, whatever they could find to cause problems, that was their desire. Because you had to maintain back in that day 60 seconds in the drive-thru. None of this five-minute kind of stuff back then. The gentleman who hired me um, was a believer. And um, he, was, he was a very diligent worker, but he had a very, very tender heart. And I would say he wasn't thick-skinned. Things got to him. When the corporate people would come in, you could just see him wilt. And you could just see with every criticism they, they offered, whether it was legit or not, and many of them were not, many of them were just to get underneath your skin. You could just see him fading and fading and fading. And I would watch him on many occasions as he got alone, he would actually start to cry. And for some reason back then, this passage came to mind to me one day. I said to him, what can they do to you? What's the worst they can do to you? Maybe you could lose your job. That would not be the end of the world. I guess it's possible if they were really haters, they could try and sever you from your family. But ultimately, they cannot take you away from the Lord. You are secure in Him. And I remember how every time corporate would come in after that, how we would remind one another, what can man do to us? And there was a sense of an encouragement, and we should be encouraged by that, even in times of distress. The Lord is for us. And therefore, the psalmist here has uh, the notion of trust. There's a, a deep trust in the Lord. Look at verses 8 and 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. There is absolutely no question. If you're going to trust in something, go for the biggest thing, the greatest thing, the strongest thing. And there is no one greater than the Lord himself. Can I get an amen on that? Better to trust in the Lord than in anything else. And we do this because we know that he is able. And we have seen in the past that he has delivered and he will continue to deliver. What I want you to notice now in verses 10 through 13, the deliverance of the Lord. But I want you to look for a couple of words there. First of all, the word surrounded, how often that appears. You might want to note the number of times. Probably some of the young people will give me an actual head count here. Also look for the counter to that, what is stronger than being surrounded. The phrase, the name of the Lord. So look for these in verses 10 through 13 now. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. I want to draw your attention again to verse 13. That is singular one person. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. This is, again, very personal here. One individual, as opposed to this psalmist, he understood it deeply. But I'd like to add, you push me, but God. You push me, but God. And notice how he speaks about the Lord in verse 14. The Lord is my strength, my song, and he has become my salvation. Amen? That phrase there, verse 14, that's significant. What does the psalmist mean? 
Well, we understand that he's actually drawing back to Moses' song as we read in Exodus, right? This was when the nation was released from bondage. They were no longer slaves in Egypt. They were released by the mighty hand of God. And you'll recall how God did that. How many plagues did he send? Ten. And they were severe plagues. And what we're reminded of is through that judgment, God's people were delivered. And that's a theme that we see often in Scripture. Through judgment, God brings salvation. By the way, for those of you who might have fears of the days to come in our nation, if God should judge our nation, then rest assured, through judgment, He will bring salvation. And as hard as it might be, if God's bringing a people to Himself, we will give Him praise and glory. The individuals have been released by God's mighty hand, and when they left, if you remember, the Egyptians were glad to see them go. They said, what do you want? Here it is. And they plundered them. They took many of their possessions as they went out. Then they got to the Red Sea. The Lord was faithful. There was a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And yet as they came to this place, having seen God deliver them, and they were going to pass on dry ground, the Bible reminds us that in that moment they struggled. Their faith was weak. And I want us to go back and see that in Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. There's a phrase in verse 8, and then there's a phrase in verse 10 that is held in juxtaposition. You see the difference here between the two, and I want us to see that in Exodus 14. I'm at verse 8 before they crossed on dry land. First of all, notice the hand of the Lord in verse 8. And the Lord, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he, the king, pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel, look at this, went out with boldness. So keep that in mind. They go out in boldness. The Lord is in control in order to have a greater deliverance for his people. Now go down to verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And remember how they went out with boldness. Now look at this. So they were not afraid. They were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So we see the cycle, right? Things are going fine. We're marching out of Egypt. There's a problem. We pray out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. can't imagine what Moses is thinking, but he said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. The Lord is my strength. He's my source for everything that I need. The one who enables me every day with every breath. Jesus said in John Gospel that I am the vine and you are the branches, and apart from me you can do nothing. So abide in Him. The Lord is my song. Anytime I'm happy, when I want to shout and sing, the reason ultimately is the Lord. If I receive something good, He is my song. He's the one who's given it. If I do anything good, the Lord is my song because He's enabled me. If I see anything that is good, He is my song. He's the one who has created all things that are good, and He is my salvation. And don't think of a puny salvation here. Don't think, oh, I did my part, and then God finished the deal. Oh, no. He is our salvation from beginning to end. Go to Psalm 79, another passage, another psalm to see. Psalm 79. This is significant because what we're talking about with the Lord's salvation is not moving from I'm doing okay to better. The Lord's salvation is I'm moving from being dead in sin to being alive in Christ. And He deals with our sins, with our iniquities, so that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Look at Psalm 79, just two verses there, 8 and 9. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Someone gave testimony of that today. How low can we go on our face before the Lord? And He's the one who forgives. Help us, O oh God, O oh God of our salvation. For the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins. For you, Bible Church, we're not afraid to acknowledge that we were sinners in need of a Savior. We don't hide from the need of a Savior to die 
to pay for our sins. We want to acknowledge His salvation accomplished more than just making our life better. He saved us and made us alive in Christ Jesus. Now, with that being said, I feel like there's so much more that I could say about the opening portion of this psalm. We're going to cover some more of it next week. But let me get to a couple of points of application and conclusion today from this psalm. The first one being this. Don't be a hater. Don't be a hater. And I say that, in my opinion, I think the worst problems are when relationships, there are conflicts. When they're severed, when they're torn apart, for whatever reason they might be. The truth of the matter is, life is already hard enough. We don't need to make it worse by being haters. Don't be petty. Don't don't seek out problems that are small and minor. Learn to bear with other individuals. And don't feel like you're the only one who can fix everybody else. So you're constantly looking for who else is in need. As much as you can, seek reconciliation. If you're the one who has caused the problem to whatever degree, then own it and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, seek forgiveness and seek restoration. And as much as able then, let's be at peace with one another. Let's go over to Romans chapter 12. Rather than me talking about it, let's hear what the Lord says about it in Romans chapter 12 and go to verse 17. We'll start there. Romans 12, 17, and I think there's probably enough in these verses. If we would focus on this and do these things, we would have our hands full for the rest of our lives. Romans 12, 17, repay no one evil for evil. We could stop right there, right? How often are you upset with someone and you just want to get back? And, And it just flies, right? It could be something you say, something you write. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Therefore, says the Lord, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's make sure that we're not haters. Next thing is this. Let's call upon the Lord when we feel like we're surrounded. Go back and look at the psalm again, verses 12 and 13. Look at how he describes it there. 12 and 13, this feeling of being surrounded. Psalm 118, verse 12. They surrounded me like bees. They were just buzzing all around, but they were quenched like a fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you're surrounded? Do you ever feel like it's just too much, it's too many? Like someone or something is just pushing you, pushing you, pushing you? We were um, yesterday at the grocery store, and I've never seen this before, but a a child was laying in the grocery court, and mom was pushing him around, and there was stuff piled on top of the child. And the child said, more, 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 more. (laughs) And I started, I wonder how long that will last, right? (laughs) At some point, he's going to feel surrounded and say, it's enough, it's enough. You know, I think sometimes we're kind of macho, right? We can handle more, give me more. But at some point we say, Lord, it is too much. I feel surrounded. And when you do, call out to the Lord. As we just saw, don't repay evil with evil. Let the Lord resolve the issue in His time. The third one is this. Know the truth. Know the truth. God is for us. And you can make it very personal. God is for me. Can I get an amen on that? When you think about salvation, Christ died for me. Christ rose from the dead for me. Christ is interceding in heaven for me. Christ is coming again for me. You can make it that personal. I'm not negating that we're a corporate body. What I'm saying is God's salvation is very particular, very personal. Now look at verse 6 again here and what he says. The Lord is on my side. That's the truth. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, whenever we have a verse like this, and there's a New Testament verse where it's quoted, it's important for us to go there. So go to Hebrews chapter 13. 
Hebrews chapter 13. I want to see, see a quote in the New Testament and see the context and find how important this verse is for you and for me. This is Hebrews chapter 13, and we're down at verse 5. The writer of Hebrews says this, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, as we see this in the New Testament, clearly, this is for those who are in Christ. Those who are not in Christ, they should be afraid. But for those who are in the Lord, you should not fear, but keep in mind you are called to be content. Now, as I thought about that this last week, I thought to myself, it might, be get, it might be easier and easier for us to be content nowadays because, honestly, we can't afford anything anymore. Prices have gone up so high, what can we pay for, right? So now we just got to be happy with what we got, right? I wish that were true. We still find ourselves striving so much for the here and now, for the stuff that we think will satisfy us and make us happy. We fight, we claw, we covet, we don't get, and we hurt others in order to possess those things. But when it comes down to it, when, when faced with those hard losses in life, you really do come to understand that the Lord is your all in all. I think about individuals, some gave testimony today about the loss of loved ones. So many during the last couple of years in our church. Um, that's when you really start to think, what is really important? And it's not the stuff that you have to move so you can walk around your house. It's not that stuff, is it? It's the Lord in relationship with other believers. There'll be others that will lose loved ones before we know it. But let me remind you of the truth. God is for us. And if your loved one passes in the Lord, remember what Scripture says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the passing of one of His own dear children, one of His saints. The next thing I want to say to you, and this is going to be extremely, I think, pertinent, especially... Well, I want to say for younger people, everybody, stand strong and rest in the Lord. Stand strong and rest in the Lord. Let's go back to our passage. I want to connect a couple of verses back in Psalm 118. Our need to stand strong and rest in the Lord. Go back to Psalm 118 again and listen to verse 5. The psalmist says, I called on the Lord in distress. And what did the Lord do? Answered me, and he set me in a broad place. Now, connect that broad place. Go over to verse 21. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The next verse, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The connection I'm making is this. The best place to stand is in Christ and in Christ alone. That is the broad place. That is the secure place. He is the chief cornerstone. Today, there is no one, we need to understand, there's no one stronger. He is the solid rock. Now, especially for those of you who are younger, but again, I think for all of us, you need to stand strong against sin in your life, and in particular as it relates to matters of purity. We live in a time where you can't hardly go out your front door without seeing some perversion of godliness and purity. It, it screams at you on every screen you look at, whether you're trying to get it or not. And the only way that you're going to find victory is to stand strong in the Lord. It will not be by fighting the flesh with the flesh. It has to be with seeking the Lord and having Him as your greatest desire. Stand firm, stand strong in the Lord. But I would also say to those of you who are raised in a performance home, stop striving to gain God's approval. Stand firm in the Lord, but stop striving. The Lord suffered and died to pay for your sins. There's nothing you can add to it. So stop trying to gain His approval, to gain His affection, to think if you do this, He will further bless you. The Lord is in control, and He'll take care of you as He sees fit. So stand strong and rest in the Lord. The last one is this. Be ready to repeat the refrain. Repeat the refrain, for His mercy endures forever. Look at again the last two verses here in verses 28 and 29. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. You can make it real simple if you want. You are my God, and I will praise you, for your mercy endures forever. You are my God, and I will praise you, 
for your mercy endures forever. You want to say it with me? Let's do it one more time. You are my God, and I will praise you, for your mercy endures forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today, not only because we're called to do it, but because as your children say by your grace, we understand that your mercy endures forever. But Lord, before we continue to give you praise, throughout not just this last week, but for many days, Lord, you know my prayer has been that if there's someone among us who does not know you, that you would have mercy. And I pray, Lord, if there is someone here today who does not know you, like the testimony was given, that you might humble that individual and they might be like that sinner in Scripture like all of us were. Beat their chest and cry out to you for mercy. I pray, Father, that you would please save the lost among us. Save the little ones among us, Lord. Call them to yourself. And Lord, please, I'm not asking you to help. Cause us to be a people who praise you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.